Primary control with critical vehicle function. Welcome to Future Thinking, episode 79. Today's guest is Dr. Erica Thompson, who wrote the excellent book Escape from Model Land, which I strongly recommend for reading. Dr. Thompson is Associate Professor of Modeling for Decision Making at UCL's Department of Science, Technology, Engineering and Public Policy. She is also a Fellow of the London Mathematical Laboratory, where she leads the research program on inference from models, and a Visiting Senior Fellow at the LSE Data Science Institute. She's working on the appropriate application of mathematical modeling in supporting real-world decisions, including ethical and methodological questions. For instance, what is the best use of models in climate change, public health and economics? Making and using models in the real world is, as it turns out, quite a tricky business. In our conversation, we go deep into the question, what constitutes model land and how can we escape model land? to achieve good results for society from what we learned within Model Land. I covered similar topics in other podcast episodes because this question can be tackled from a number of different perspectives. Please, as always, check out the show notes. In the show notes you find references to articles, books and the like, and also to other episodes such as episode 68, Modell in Realität, ein Gespräch mit Dr. Andreas Windisch, and episode 53 and 54, Data Science and Machine Learning, Hype and Reality. Now to a conversation with Dr. Erica Thompson. Hello, Erica. Thank you very much for joining in this conversation. Hello. Great to be here. You wrote a very interesting book that I read recently named Escape from Model Land. And of course, I recommend all uh, listeners to read this book too. But the title of the book obviously begs the question, what is Model Land? Okay, well, start at the beginning. So I guess what I mean by model land is is where we are when we're sort of inside the model. Um, so you might have made a model in Excel, you might have made a model in some complicated programming language, you might just have an idea about how one thing relates to another, and it's kind of a very conceptual model. But the, the idea of model land is that is where you are when when your assumptions are true, when everything sort of works by assumption, and you're inside the boundaries of the model. So you can you can do whatever it is you set out to do. You know, you can you can make definite statements about how X relates to Y within your model. And so model land is is where you are there within that boundary. But of course nobody actually cares at all about what happens in your model, right? There is no reason for anybody to have any interest in this unless you are making a claim that what happens within that model land has some relationship to what happens in the real world. And so we make models because we want to understand the real world and we want to be able to use the model to think about how we can intervene and what kind of actions we can take in the real world to achieve the outcomes that we want. And so so then it matters, of course, whether the model is any good or not, because if you have a fantastic model, which is really accurate and it represents the things that you want to know, then you can perform experiments on the model and take them to have meaning in the real world. And you can use that to inform your decision making. But if you have a model that is maybe not very good or it's not very reliable or it doesn't represent the kind of things that you're actually interested in or or maybe it's really reliable for a few things but actually it's terrible for these other things then the question of how you get out of model land how you transfer your judgments about the model to a judgment about the real world is i think the key question and so that's that's the the concept of the book and that's the the question that i've tried to answer which reminds me to a very fundamental question. I recently heard a conversation with Stephen Wolfram. I'm also going to link this in the show notes, also maybe to remind the listeners that all of the references will be in the show notes. Just please look that up. And Stephen Wolfram talked about the irreducibility of nature so that actually if you would like to know how nature plays out, well, you have to see how nature plays out. And as soon as you model it in any way, you always are limiting your understanding in some way. And maybe you can also talk a little bit about this, also maybe in reference to different types of models, because I remember when I studied chemistry, we started also with models, like for instance, the ideal gas model or something like that. Mm -hmm. And even when you go to physical models where many people believe, oh yeah, that must be very precise there. But when you then, for instance, look at the ideal gas model, it's like a model that has a lot of assumptions that are ideal, ideal in the sense of you take away some 
constraints from reality. And then you create, for instance, in that case, that famous equation PV is NRT, for instance. But that's actually not working in reality with real gases. When you go to real gases, you then have to ad make adjustment factors and I don't know what. And uh, physical models still are often seen as quite of a, how, don't know, how should I say, quite of a high standard. But then we, when you go to complex systems, then we are again further away. Maybe uh, you have some yeah. idea about these things? I mean, I suppose I like to distinguish between models that do work very well, because I think it's incontrovertible that there are many models which are incredibly successful and really they form the basis of the modern world and much of the technology that we rely on. And so, you know, we can say that if I make a model of throwing a basketball or, you know, the kind of ballistic motion trajectories required to get a spaceship to Mars, you know, these sorts of things, we can, we can do that, we can do it really well, we can do it really accurately, and we have justified confidence in the output of our model because we are always able able to kind of pin it back to reality. But of course, at, at the other end of the spectrum, there are these models where we are, you know, modeling extremely complex systems. It's not clear what the natural variables are necessarily of the system even. Uh, and then I think you do run into these questions of perhaps irreducibility, as you said. Anything that you ignore might turn out later to have been important and might turn out to be first order in terms of the kind of things you want to know. And so perhaps then there's... Um, You know, my interest is kind of in the middle uh, with models where we are not fully data driven, you know, and, and so I kind of set this up as being a question of whether we are interpolating or extrapolating. And that for many really successful models, which are very much data driven models, we are interpolating. We have we have a set of observations and we want to generate a model which will enable us to make a prediction, but a prediction that is happening within the domain that we've already explored. So we already have observations of what will happen at these different variables. And we've got a new one, but it's not outside the range that we're already familiar with. And so so weather models, for example, fall more or less into that category, that we have extremely good weather models. You can take your phone out of your pocket and look at the weather forecast for tomorrow. And you know that, you know, it's not perfect. You know that it's not perfect, but you know how much confidence you ought to have in it because you're familiar with past observations of the, the weather and the model and how good it was. And you can construct a statistical picture. And that's because tomorrow's weather is basically drawn from the same set as yesterday's weather and the weather of the last 50 years. Now, of course, there is a question about extreme events. That's when we're going to the very edge of our range of interpolation and we start to be doing extrapolation. And there's also a question about climate change and the degree to which we expect these distributions to move. And so we might, again, be moving into a more extrapolatory rather than interpolatory domain. But in principle, the weather forecast tends to do extremely well and it is data driven in the sense that we can quantify our uncertainty and our expectation of how reliable it is and how confident we ought to be in it. But then when you go further outside, so for example, if you're trying to forecast social systems, anything with any kind of human decisions or politics that's involved, then we start to run into things that can't be determined with reference to data. And so we are necessarily extrapolating any system where the underlying conditions are changing. So climate change is kind of in the middle because we expect that the laws of physics will remain the same. You know, we don't we don't expect the speed of light to change tomorrow. We don't expect the acceleration of due to gravity to change tomorrow. We don't expect the basic equations of fluid dynamics to change tomorrow. And so we have all of those to sort of base our model upon that gives us fundamental reasons to be confident in the high level messages. But when we're talking about the details of of what the you know the distribution of weather, so the climate will be like in 2100, actually we are going a long way beyond the calibration data that we have. And so we have to be careful about what kinds of assumptions and expert judgments we are making that we're putting into the model to generate our uncertainty ranges about what we expect to see. And so I'd really, you know, I think it's a good starting point for the discussion to, to sort of distinguish between those two far ends of the spectrum and say that what we're really interested in is somewhere in the middle, not the not these completely data-driven approaches 
where we think we can do really well and we have a lot of confidence and also not the far end the other far end of the spectrum where everything is just super difficult because it's all contingent on social and political decisions and attitudes but in the middle where we have some confidence but we're not quite sure how much and we are also making strong judgments and assumptions about the degree to which the future will be like the past in different respects i find this uh Distinction between interpolation and extrapolation also very interesting because you have also certain statistical um, methods which just comes to my mind. Like, for instance, neural networks and stuff like that tend to work relatively well as long as you interpolate, but the error like explodes as soon as you start to extrapolate. And some people don't take this into consideration as they yeah, probably should. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, this question about AI and what AI or sort of fully data driven approaches can do for you if you, you know if you have made the judgment that you are in an interpolatory regime then your data driven approaches can be fantastic you know they can do really well and they can be extremely powerful and they can do things perhaps that you wouldn't have done by more standard methods provide um, data quality and provided all of you that have enough data and it's a good enough quality data and all the rest of it so you know once you've sort of solved that then crack on you know do the ai stuff and go for it But if you think you might be in an in extrapolatory regime, then, you know, just drawing the kind of basic sketch of a few points and saying, well, we could fit a line to it, we could fit a curve to it, we could fit a cubic to it, and thinking about how that massively changes the, the prediction that you might make out of sample, then it's clear that we need to be much more careful and that if we start taking completely data-driven approaches to extrapolatory problems and saying, oh, you know, I'm just looking for the best fit then uh, we could go horribly, horribly wrong mm. out of sample. I think we're going to get later to some examples, climate change, COVID, also economic models, but I would like to stick a little bit more to, let's say, a bit of a theoretical um, question. The one thing was the interpolatory or the extrapolation part, but I think there's also another another aspect which I find very fascinating, which people often also don't um, take into consideration, uh, is that there are models that I would call it like that are sort of independent, where, where the model is independent of the system and models that are self-referential. Something that, what I mean is, yeah. like the weather model, for instance, the weather model does not influence the weather, at least not yet. Maybe in 50 years, if you, if you modify the weather, yeah, okay, right. but at the moment, so the weather forecast doesn't modify the weather. But let's but a say central a bank forecast, forecast for exactly, inflation central bank forecast or these sorts of things, yes, changes absolutely, the economy, is part of the system, it changes the economy, the and, and a similar thing it. is yeah. like with, with uh, maybe, maybe with uh, stuff like climate change, because there are so many social assumptions there, how is the economic activity, how is the population development, I don't know and what not, and all of that could feed into itself, right? Yeah, yeah. And things like, you know, COVID models change the way we think about COVID. They think about, they change the way that we consider the kinds of interventions that we might make. They shape the way that we sort of measure and understand and intervene and then kind of make sense of, you know, they are telling the story for us in a way. And so, so yes, absolutely. You know, I suppose there are there are two different kind of regimes and then maybe a mix. So we can say that models are to some extent performative, as in they create the reality that they are uh, modeling. And so something like um, a central bank model saying that inflation will be low, you know, is to is to some extent performative because they want inflation to be low. And if they if the central bank were to say, oh, no, there's going to be a financial crisis tomorrow, then it would happen. <laughs> Because people are looking at that and they're using that as input to their decisions. And so so some models are performative in that sense and others are counter-performative in that you model something in order to try to avoid it. So all of these questions about worst case scenarios, climate change worst case scenarios or COVID, the sort of worst case scenarios that were put about regarding the spread of COVID in the early days, you know, those were not made with the aim of being accurate models and correctly predicting the future. They were made with the aim of showing what could happen if we didn't act and motivating action, which would then avoid these worst case scenarios. And so they they prevent the outcome coming about. Now, in practice, you know, you have a bit of 
both probably going on in most situations. A model could be used to predict your best case scenario and your worst case scenario. And then you take actions somewhere in the middle and you land up in between because you have multiple different trade-offs and other things that you have to consider. And the model also doesn't necessarily tell you the perfect outcome because maybe the model tells you about illness and uh, mortality due to a pandemic disease, but it doesn't tell you about the impact on mental health. It doesn't tell you about the impact of lockdowns or interventions on other aspects of the economy. And so, you know, you're you're sort of stuck with a very partial model, which isn't necessarily telling you the whole truth. And then you have to integrate that with other sources of information to make a, a more considered decision. So the model is then very much part of the story. It, it is not just a prediction engine aiming to predict what the future will look like in the sense that, as you say, a weather model is just a prediction engine saying, what will the future look like? We can't take action to avoid the cyclone or the thunderstorm or the flood. We can only ch take action to prevent that being damaging to us. Yeah, you mentioned a number of very interesting aspects. The one is that I didn't even have on my, I didn't even think about is like that there is a clear difference between a prediction and a scenario. Mm. And I also think like in media coverage or even political uh, use, I think it's not often made clear enough what we're talking about. Are we talking about a prediction actually, like a weather forecast? So prediction would mean in my definition that The prediction can be right or wrong. So I predict how something will be sometime in the future, and this can be right or wrong. Whereas a scenario is like a possible path into the future under certain limited circumstances, conditions, whatnot. Yeah. But it's a scenario. So there are multiple scenarios possible, right? Yeah. And if you don't distinguish this properly in the communication, then it can be also quite confusing what you're doing, right? Yep. Yeah, you can have a conditional prediction or an unconditional prediction. And in the, I mean, in the climate sphere, we, we refer to the conditional predictions as projections. So you say, if the following conditions are the case, then this is what would happen. And you make multiple projections of possible outcomes. And then, of course, the aim is to choose between your inputs. You know, you have a sort of dependent variable and an independent variable. And you say, well, we can change climate policy or we can change lockdowns or we can change our the fiscal pressures that central bank can bring to bear. You know, you can you can change you have certain things that you are able to change and certain outcomes that you want to see. And the model tells you how the things that you might change hopefully change your outcomes. But it only gives you a partial picture. You know, you couldn't you couldn't then go back and say, right, we're going to just conduct a full sensitivity analysis and optimize and find out what the best possible set of inputs are. That just doesn't work because your model isn't fully capturing all of the things that are important about the situation. I find this very fascinating. Also, this, the other thing that you said before, namely that a model is always, and we said this in the beginning about like. Uh, what Stephen Warfram said about the uh, irreducibility of nature. So you always have to limit in a way what your model describes, be it the COVID model, as you, as you, for instance, made the example, the COVID model doesn't describe what is the psychological effect on elderly people who don't visit their, I don't know, children anymore, or what is the effect of school children who don't go to school or are masked in school. So all of these effects are not in the epidemiological model of COVID, obviously. Yeah. So which then yeah, begs the question, okay, so how helpful is it in the end? And, yeah, uh, I mean, and, and it's not in principle yeah. impossible to include those sorts of things in a model. You could construct well, a model which includes all of these. Then, you, then you're down to the you question of data quality. This. What does it mean? How are you going to measure it? What matters? How are you going to decide which bits to include? You know, I suppose one, another key point of my book is that is that all of these decisions about model construction imply value judgments about what we think to be important. And so your decision to make a model which incorporates morbidity and mortality due to a pandemic, but doesn't include mental health impacts or economic impacts, that is a value judgment. And it, it's not bad in itself, because obviously, You know, you if you start to include absolutely everything in a model, then it becomes unwieldy and impossible to interpret. And there are too many things going on to be able to say anything with any certainty. You know, that's why we make models is to simplify, to gain more yes, essential exactly. insights. So I'm not saying that these models should have included 
any of these other things. You know, they probably shouldn't. It, it makes sense to partition the problem and to talk about one thing at a time. But the question is then, how does that go to the decision maker? So the decision maker has the responsibility then to be integrating alternate perspectives. So perhaps the problem is that, you know, once you've got a shiny model that's been produced by an expert that comes from somebody with the right letters after their name in a prestigious institution, and it's been published in a scientific paper, you know, all of these sorts of things, then it then it kind of gains authority and prestige, and it starts to look like the best source of information. I think that's when we need to be careful to make sure that we are, you know, integrating insights from different perspectives. Because, you know, if if we get kind of captured by one set of models, which have one set of perspectives and one set of embedded value judgments, we're implying that those value judgments are and should be shared by everybody. And of course, they're not necessarily. I think about value judgment, maybe maybe this has two perspectives. The one is that maybe you can also talk a little bit about this later. It's like many people have the impression, or maybe even some scientists provide the impression, I don't know, that like a model is something mathematical and something, you know, clean and, and, and nice, and you just you just do it and then it's fine. But in, in, in reality a model has to be adjusted and, and tempered with and like yeah. so that you get And suddenly you have problems like in in climate models, for instance, I read a, a book about this, and then you have the problem, yeah, but the real physics, like temperature and pressure and so on, don't really translate well into the model, and then you have to adapt it. And so so you 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 are in such a complex environment that you have to adjust the model left and right. Yeah. So that you get sort of a fitting picture, but that also yeah, then you have to ask the question, okay, but how accurate is this then in the long run? Because often we see that models work rather nicely in the short run, but in the long run, they can be f widely off the mark. And maybe the second thing that came to my mind was you said, okay, we have to limit models to particular, to not make it unwieldy wide. I totally agree. But then I have to say, I'm a bit, I'm personally a bit frustrated about how models were used in the last years in COVID and other instances, because my gut feeling was that maybe how we used models actually inflicted more damage on us than than good because exactly that did not happen it was modeled and then people did i think also like you had the uk models in uh, the, the the covid mm -hmm. models in uk that were also quite heavily criticized exactly because it covers a certain amount of the rea a certain aspect of reality but not everything like if we would do everything to avoid climate change let's say And then the side effect would be that we completely ruin our economies and we have no energy and billions of people die because they have no energy. Then we might have averted climate change, but the situation would probably not be better than it's now. So we always have opportunity costs and a lot of other aspects to take into consideration as well, right? Yeah. And I suppose the question then is whether it's appropriate to put all of those into one model or to have each individual model which has a partial view of the situation and does come with assumptions and with value judgments and with blind spots to put all of those to have have many of those and to put them together and not to privilege one over the other you know to be able to say from the decision making perspective here are the values on which we are trying to make decisions and then here are the models that are coming in that are providing information to us Which ones of these models are the most relevant? Which ones are the most useful? Which ones are aligned with our values and our system of decision making? And I think the problem is where you sort of don't talk about the values. You just kind of make an assumption that everybody shares the same values and then you, uh, and they're, they're not criticized and they're not, not highlighted, not made obvious. Uh, in the models, because as you say, it's easy for the the models and the modelers to kind of go, oh, you know, but it's a it's a model, it's maths, it's objective, it's science. Follow the science. I think that's really unhelpful. Uh, but I think it also results a bit from this confusion about the the you know the ends of the spectrum, the interpolatory data driven models, which are incredibly successful. They do do extremely well, and that kind of gives us perhaps too much confidence in the extrapolatory, more assumption driven or judgment driven models, which. Uh, have much more to do with the politics and the social context and the value judgments that are going into them. You know, because it doesn't matter what your social context or value judgments are if you're making a model of a, of a basketball or of a, 
uh, the trajectory of a spaceship or something like that, because you know you are tied back to the data and the equations, and these are verifiable, and everything is in sample. So you just need to take more data, and you will get the right answer. But when we're talking about extrapolatory models, you can't do that. You know, in principle, you can't do that. It's not just a question of not having enough data. It's a question of not having clear agreement on what we're doing here. What what is the point? What are the values? What do we think is important? And so I think, you know, that's that's where I find it really helpful to make that distinction and to be clear where we are on the spectrum before then trying to talk in these terms about what could have been done differently or how how models could more effectively support decision making. And we also have the additional problem that just uh, comes to my attention is that once you use, maybe get to this later too, but once you use models for decision making, you sometimes, how should I say, pull the rug under the model in the sense that you cannot really check any more if the model is even accurate. Let, let me give an example of what I mean by that. From my from my knowledge in the US, in some parts of the US, they use models to predict or or yeah to predict if uh, imprisoned people would uh, mm. how do you say when they when they become, reoffend uh, yeah you re well, exactly would reoffend again so like to make a risk assessment by I don't know what data feeds into that model I don't know so someone created that model and now this model is applied and now people are judged by that model. And by the very fact that I'm using that model, I cannot verify it anymore, obviously, because I'm leaving certain people in and certain people out. So I, you know what I mean? So this is also a very different, difficult problem, no? Yeah, yeah. I mean, to some extent, the same goes for climate models. You know, we make predictions of what will happen at high levels of climate change with the aim of avoiding them. And so we hope that it will never be verifiable because we hope never to get to that point. And the same with the the kind of high high scenarios for COVID. You know, we make the prediction in order to take action to avoid it and to and specifically to avoid verifying the performance of the model. You know, we we want not to be able to verify it. That yes, is awkward. But, it's a difficult yes, question. Yes, but I could say <laughs> I could say the difference is like in let's say COVID or or climate change, if if I use this model correctly, then there are more like scenarios, okay? And then yeah, I try to right. avoid and it. You have an alternative but when I charge your life by a model And then I do not allow you, for instance, to go to university because my assumption is you're not clever enough. But who knows? The model says you're not clever enough. Maybe you are. Yeah. So I take this opportunity away from you. So this is, yeah. I think we're getting into very critical territory there. Yeah, completely. I mean, the mod the model is creating the reality. It is, it's in dialogue with reality. It is not just... It is not just modeling. It is not just predicting what will happen and kind of sitting separately. It is part of the system. I think all of these models that we've talked about are part of the system. And that is, you know, it, again, that's kind of the difference between interpolation and extrapolation as well. You know, it's a slightly tangential point, but it's, it's the same kind of idea that either we are in a system where the data that we have are adequate for the purpose of understanding the future, or we are in a system where the data that we have are not the sole determinant of what the future will look like, in which case everything is part of the system. I would like to bring two quotations um, to maybe give a different maybe different perspective on models and then maybe conclude by asking you what is your opinion on how we handled models at the moment and if they really benefited. The two quotations, one is from Ludwig von Bertalanffy, who is a, was a system theorist in Austria and one was a US one, And in, in his uh, main book, General System Theory, in, in the 60s, one, I have to say, though, he wrote that models um, serve as working hypotheses for further research. So if I understand him correctly, his, his idea was that a model is sort of like a punching ball for, or like, a, like uh, mm. something like that, where you put your hypothesis in and then you model and then you figure out if your assumption about the world is correct and you use the model sort of as a, maybe as a test bed for your science but not necessarily for predictive purposes or for societal purposes. And the second one I wanted to uh, bring is from Nassim Taleb, who is, of course, more in the economic domain, who is very critical about model usage. I mean, he says, like, okay, you only should use a model when you're really certain that the model is of high predictive value and, and not in, in these... Uh, Uh, long tail problems where you have individual individual events can completely change everything. This Black Swan events, he says, is more of the opinion that we should build a society that is resistant to model errors. So 
because I, I think we often do the opposite. We make models and then we say, yeah, yeah, econom economy is well. And then we have a meltdown like in 2008, right? And that there was an article in, a, in an Austrian newspaper years ago where they compared like the predictions of the leading economic institutions, like, I don't know, some, some economic predictions. And they were all so wildly off <laughs> after like they predicted like for a yep. year after the first quarter, they were wildly off in all directions, all of them yep. and yep. over years. So they were never right, actually. Yep. So, uh, but if you make the enough, other, then the if you make enough predictions, then somebody will be right. <laughs> and then at the end, you know, you make 20 different predictions. One of them's right. Then you say, then that guy becomes the, the guru. By the way, <laughs> by the way you, you know this, you know this, uh, this uh, scheme of... Uh, That this is a scheme of uh, how you say like of um, cheating people mm. that you that you uh, write to let's say thousand people a prediction like this and that stock will go up or down and you split it in half yeah and then you only and follow you up the same thing again with the ones right. that were right yeah and then in the end you have like hundred people where you made six correct correct predictions it's just just yeah. a random hit right and then they're convinced and they'll give you all then their they're money. convinced yeah. and then they give you give you <laughs> your uh, their your money to for for you to yeah. I don't know. Yeah, to, to. Okay, so but so this would be very critical uh, perspectives on modeling. So what would be your uh, your yeah yeah okay. idea about what we did in the last years, what we're doing currently? Do you think that we get politicians and and uh, the public to a position where they understand where the limit of a model is, what a model means, or? Do you rather believe we should be very careful in using models in public because they will always be overinterpreted? Well, I think we do have to be careful about using models in public, but I don't think, you know, I don't think that means we have to throw them away. I don't, I, you know, I think models are how we think about the future. So there is no, there's no getting away from them. I think the question really is to ensure that we have a diversity of perspectives available to us and that we're not kind of captured by one model or by some kind of groupthink set of models which come from the same perspectives, the same value judgments, making the same assumptions, and therefore end up being overconfident in one certain way of thinking and one particular kind of way of viewing the world and interacting with the world. So maybe to go back to those quotes, I mean, the I think I'd kind of disagree with the the one about working hypotheses for further research. I mean, yes, I think in for the interpolatory, the data-driven models, that is kind of what they are. And you use further data to sort of correct them progressively to make them better and better. Whereas I think for the complex systems, it's actually really hard to see them in that way because of the sensitivity to further development. You know, you, you could have your model, which is pretty good, and then you add in another system or another process And actually, everything flips around. You know, complex models are big dynamical complex systems, and they can be very sensitive to additional parameters. And so I think once you're talking about these big complex models, it can be very difficult to use them as working hypotheses and as incremental developmental stages of understanding because they are sensitive. So, in, I mean, Taleb's point then, I mean, I'm generally in agreement with Taleb uh, about all of this, really, apart from perhaps sometimes the way that he phrases it. If you have skin in the game, yes, you, you use reliable models. I suppose I would go a bit further and say that if you are wanting a prediction, then yes, you only use reliable models. But perhaps you're not necessarily wanting a prediction. Perhaps you understand that prediction is impossible And perhaps then rather than having nothing at all, you would like to use the model to tell a story. Perhaps you're using the model as a, a narrative generating device and a communication tool. And it helps to, you know, it, it, it's it, to some extent, it may be used as a justification for taking a certain course of action. It's a way of thinking collectively. And so I think a model can be useful for that without necessarily being predictively accurate at all. But would this not be misleading? Because Obviously, it would be better. Well, but you can have you can have a conceptual model um, which kind of thinks through the way that you know the way that people interact with each other or the way that you know some process works. 
without understanding it. And, you know, even if you don't write it down in a model, you probably still have that in the back of your mind as kind of the way that you are grasping and understanding and thinking about that system. And so actually putting it out in the open a bit more and being more transparent about it probably is a benefit as long as you don't then become captured by the idea that this is the only way of thinking about it and that it is the only or that the predictions that it might make would be more reliable than they actually are. You know, you always have to be critical about models, I think. You always have to be ready to understand what it is that you can get from them and what it is that you can't get from them. But there are things that we do get from models which are not solely related to their quantitative accuracy. It's and those are things like, you know, this narrative generation and the communication and kind of collective thinking you know the idea like like the idea of flatten the curve that was so popular in the in the early days of the pandemic that was that was a use of a a very simplified model you know massively oversimplified and typically the way it was drawn didn't include any numbers and it was just a you know somebody had kind of hand drawn a curve there was no particular basis in anything numerical other than saying, you know, it starts off being exponential, but if we can keep it down, you know, it, it will, the curve will kind of go down. And if we can push it down, then it will infect people over a longer time and then not overwhelm the health system. You know, that was a very, very, very crude model. And it came from the epidemiological modeling community thinking only about infection and hospitalization rates. And it didn't come with any numbers attached. So it was not verifiable at all. But it performed a function of collective thinking and collective mm. understanding and narrative and communication, which was valuable. You know, I think you can't say that that wasn't valuable, mm. even it, though it, it, even it, though it, it wasn't me. predictive. It reminds me a bit to the to the old saying. I forgot now who said it, but like, uh, no plan survives the first contact with the enemy, yes. <laughs> or, or yeah. the other way around. Like the plan is useless, but the process plan of planning is useless, but the planning is indispensable. Yeah, exactly. Something but like it's that. it's about the thinking, and it's you know the value of a model can be more in in the sort of tacit knowledge and understanding and expertise that you gain by creating a model and and sort of challenging it with data. You know, that can be more helpful, actually, than the model itself. Yes. But this really requires people who make models or politicians or managers or whatever they use it to be very clear about what they can do and what they cannot do and how they can help and how they cannot help. Absolutely. It does. And <laughs> because, I, because to come also a little bit more to the question of decision making and accountability, I'm working in management consulting since many years. I was also manager in a larger company and I also observed how planning processes in larger companies work and so on. And I, I had a conversation with a, a friend of mine who was like in, in top management in large companies. And he told me, you know, we always make plans and, 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 and financial plans for the next years. And they never, they never, they just never, you know, the window. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> they, they, they never really work out the way you plan it. Yeah. So, and, and to oppose that, I just, uh, one of the recent episodes I, I recorded with a physicist, is very popular in, in, in Austria. I see two sides here of the picture. The one is like physicists often have this picture. We need to be precise. We have to be data driven. We have to, you know, numbers and we can calculate things and so on and so forth. We just, if you don't have numbers and then you just don't do, you're not doing it right. You're not yeah. doing it properly. And then you have other people like Gerd Gigarenza or others who say, you know, well, careful, careful. And this is, would be more my position. As soon as you're in a complex environment, You simply cannot get the numbers in any reasonable detail so that you can make believable predictions over the long term. But intuition can still be very helpful in decision making. But of course, we live in a society where intuition is not warranted. If you, if you are a politician and say, you know, I take this decision by intuition. Oh my God, I would like to see the headlines on the next, mm. on the next <laughs> uh, day in the newspapers. And yeah. in, in management, the situation as far as I observe, it's very often like that, that when you have good managers, that they actually decide intuition-based, but of course, because they know intuition is not good, then and they, they hire three consulting companies yeah. or four modelers until they yeah. get the model or the consultant confirmation that confirms their intuition. So That's what they call policy-based evidence-making. Pol yes. <laughs> policy-based evidence-making. This is very good. I have to know. Yeah. Um, I mean, yes. So it's a tricky one. I mean, I think the... I suppose my um, 
contention in the book is really that actually there is less of a distinction between models and on human intuition than we might like to think, um, that we sort of put models up on this pedestal, again, because we're sort of conflating the success of the interpolatory models with you know, the possible success of the extrapolatory ones, which contain more judgment. And so I think that these extrapolatory models actually are primarily numerical representations of intuition and expert judgment. As such, you know, we should be kind of treating them in the same Sorry, way. Sorry, because the expert judgment goes into the because adjustment the of the model. Because the expert judgment right? goes into the model, goes into goes into deciding what you think is important. And but then know, it's not necessarily clear to the consumer anymore, right? No, because the not consumer at all. might have the idea, yeah. oh, that's the consumer sees and, it and, and, and thinks and thinks, you know, this is like the weather forecast for tomorrow, or it's like mm -hmm. the um, like it's it's like you know the ideal gas law or the trajectory of a basketball, and they and they give it more evidentiary strength than it ought to have than it really warrants. Yeah, I think I think if we kind of reframe the idea of these extrapolatory models and say that what they are is an encapsulation of somebody's intuition and their expert judgment, then the question is much more about, you know, who is an expert? How do we decide who an expert is? Mm -hmm. Who has credibility to be kind of to be putting their own value judgments and their expertise onto that pedestal? How do we decide? Is it is it somebody with the right letters after their name from the right institution, published in the right journals? Or is it somebody with uh, lived experience? Is it somebody, you know, you, you can imagine a lot of different ways of, of approaching that. Um, thinking about climate change, for instance, is it right that atmospheric physics is the basis of our mm. climate models? Or should we really be starting with ecosystems, say, or mm. or human systems mm. and working out to include to include the climate, the sort of physical climate? You said something here that is very, very dear to my heart, so to speak, because something I, I was thinking a lot in the last um, years is like to discuss what is expertise, who is an expert. Mm. And because someone turns up on television and is now the expert for the pandemic. So like, and then if you, if you criticize this person, then you criticize science suddenly, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's not how the world is supposed to work, in my opinion, We, because in complex problems, we see that there are a lot of experts who have different opinions or more nuanced opinions or see different aspects. And I think this discussion, who do we put on the table and, and who not? And, and, and why do we bring, do we also bring on the table people who have antagonizing opinions and so on? For me, this is the much more important yeah. discussion than what the yeah, model absolutely. tells me in the end. And I, you know, I think you can see very clearly that trust is a social process and expertise is socially determined. It is not something that is, that can be quantified as a, you know, some function of your past. It is, I will accept you as an expert if I have confidence that you have the right expertise and that you share my values. You know, that's important as well. And so I think that there's a conversation which is very much missing about the values and politics of decision making, which kind of have been have been pushed to one side in this stampede towards mm. evidence-based decision making and towards the numerical and the quantitative and the financial and the scientific, if if you like, and away from the questions about values and politics. I, I think that that's a huge mistake because it mm. means that the values and politics are then implicit in the models rather than being open and transparent. And, explicit, and it means yeah. that people haven't got the starting point to be able to enter into that conversation. If you say the only starting point into this conversation is scientific and you must Uh, you know, you must have epidemiology expertise or you must have climate science expertise in order to participate in this conversation. I think that's really incredibly damaging. And what we see as a result of that is these is the sort of skeptic community and the and the lack of faith in science, where actually I think if you could have a a more open discussion about values and politics, then you could say, well, actually, here's somebody who disagrees. They don't disagree with the with the science and with the model, but they disagree about the value judgments that are implicit in the kinds of things that you have allowed to be represented in this model. And they have priorities which are beyond the model. And we need to be thinking about those, you know, then that, that just feels like a much, it's a difficult question, right? It's a hard discussion to have. And you can see that it is 
you know, you can see the increasing polarization across different societies, uh, you know, across the whole world right now about these questions of values and politics. Yeah, but I think. But I, to I, just I, ignore that and say, you must follow the science yeah, is saying yeah. you must agree with my value judgments. And exactly. that, that, I think, yeah. is not is not reasonable. Exactly. I couldn't agree more. I think we I think we, we were afraid to talk about values. We were afraid mm. to do that. And then we said, no, no, you know, it's science. No, it's not science. It's in most cases science. And the decision the decision is never science-based because I always found this a very bad idea. A decision not- can never be science-based because exactly. you can always say, you know, if this, then that is what will happen. And if we do that, then this other thing is what will happen. But yeah. you have to you have to have a value judgment about which outcome you prefer. Exactly. And even in very dramatic cases, like if, okay, I I understand the law of gravity and I still jump from the 10th floor because I want to commit suicide. So I understand the law of gravity. You can choose, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Your value judgment is Most people, most people would not do that. But if this is exactly what I want to do, then this is a value judgment. It's not, I didn't, I didn't act anti-science. No, I did not act anti-science. I acted exactly according to science. I just had a different value here. And, yeah, exactly. And, and I think you see the same thing in climate skepticism. You see it in the kind of anti-vaccine skepticism of big pharma and their values. Uh, you see it, you know, you see it across society. But the point is that it won't be helped by just doing more science and, and exactly. banging more loudly on the table and saying, this is science, this is value free, and you've got to agree with it. That exactly. just doesn't work. You know, it's like saying, if I say I'm a mind reader and and I and I get you to get a pack of cards on your desk and I predict the first five cards and I do it correctly, are you going to believe that I'm a mind reader? Well, if you sort of think that that is a plausible outcome then you will be fully convinced and I'll keep predicting them and you'll be you'll be completely convinced as a good bayesian would be every observation will give you greater confidence that I am a mind reader but if you believe it to be physically impossible then every correct answer that I give you will give you greater confidence that I'm cheating in some way and so the way to convince you that I am actually a mind reader is not just to generate more evidence and keep doing the same thing again. It's to it's to include you in the experimental process and to mm. say, actually, let's do it in your study. You can choose the pack of cards. I'll have my hands tied behind my back and you can check that I've got no listening devices or anything. And then maybe you'd be convinced. I think what happened a little bit is sort of a sleight of hand. Like you and I might have, let's say, a different value judgment about a particular topic. And then I somehow do not want to confront you or, or confront yeah. you or exactly. discuss it's this too openly. It's difficult to talk about it's values. The, and it's, then I'm coming it's seen up as with being some, not scientific. Yeah. Exactly. Then I come up with some scientific idea and I say, no, you, you don't have a different value. You're unscientific. Yeah. And also immoral. You're immoral too because you're unscientific and immoral. And by that, I hit the... The, the, the value judgment behind some sign, science facade or, or yeah science facade but it comes back and it comes back uh, with a vengeance and then we have the then we have the discussion we have at the moment yeah so thinking about the mind reading thing I mean what we need to do to give people in general more confidence in models is to open up those value judgments to greater transparency to have a wider diversity of models available to be used that reflect different value judgments and that includes value judgments that might not be particularly palatable to the majority of people who are currently involved in the scientific process because the kind of people who are doing science are white western middle class well educated people who uh, you know have the best of intentions i'm not saying that there's any conspiracy or any you know or any deliberate attempt to stifle discussion i think you know that would be going too far but i think that you know that that sort of homogeneity of of thought and perhaps of political standpoint and lived experience you know that results in models which which encapsulate that particular way of thinking. And so they do necessarily end up pushing the discussion in certain directions. And I think we can we can admit to that without saying that that means that science is terrible and bad and shouldn't mm. be used for decision making. Science is great and incredibly valuable. And these models are, you know, they are the best source of insight that we have about the future. We just need to ensure that we are you know, reflecting the whole of society in the way that we construct them and reflecting the values of society and being transparent about those values. And where there are disagreements about values, that we reflect that in the evidence basis rather than just steamrolling it by saying, here is the model Mm. and the model is right. 
Yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. It's just maybe one one last word to val uh, to values because I also mentioned this discussion of values in other episodes because like we have I think a similar situation like when we constantly talk about innovation, but innovation means nothing really. Innovation just means you have something new, right? Yeah. But so if in so what we have innovation, great. So what does it mean? And I think in the public discourse we also here hesitate to discuss about values because an innovation becomes progress in my understanding as soon as it increases the quality of society or increases some quality but this is a value judgment is a smartphone progress i don't know it depends on on it's clearly innovation so we, we can it's clearly uh, innovation we, yeah we can we, agree, agree, on that we can agree but, that quickly but, but yeah is it's it, a good thing yeah is it a pro exactly is it a good thing and as, and as soon as i ask you that We can disagree because we can have different value judgments, but now it becomes interesting. Now it becomes interesting and important, right? The innovation per se is not interesting. Oh, it might be interesting, but it's not, uh, it's just a starting point, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, completely. I, I would like to conclude with a question which is somehow adjacent, uh, adjacent to this problem, namely regulation and how we handle complex problems. And mm. maybe also because clearly there are models that can also increase risks in society maybe you could you could say a word to that and then we could discuss the question a very important question at the moment how do we handle complex systems from financial systems to i don't know artificial intelligence if you will right by the way also the value thing comes in recently you hear discussion here and there yeah artificial intelligence but it should have human values Yeah, but which ones? Which ones? Yeah. Which exactly. human values? Yours or mine, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's the same issue here, right? So, but maybe, maybe to to models that can increase risk. Maybe you can you can um, say yeah. some words about that. Okay, so so sort of regulation of complex systems um, using models. Well, I mean, good examples, as you say, are in the finance industry. So regulation of banking, um, solvency of insurance in, uh, insurance companies, and that sort of thing. Um, And yes, you sort of end up in an arms race of of a complex model versus another complex model. You know, one trying to find a way to dampen the behavior in the system, and another finding a way to exploit the behavior of the system and making it less less stable. Yeah, regulation is always going to be tricky, and this comes back again to the point about complex systems being sensitive to to changes, and that's that's both in terms of you know, the the famous butterfly effect, the changes to initial conditions, and also what I call the hawk moth effect, which is, by analogy with the butterfly effect, the change of model structure. So when you introduce a new process or system into a model, you know, you don't just make an incremental change necessarily to the outputs of that model. You can make a really uh, fundamental change to the way that it works and the kind of outputs that you get. And I think that certainly should lead us to some degree of humility in uh, how we manage or regulate complex systems. It is it is difficult and that in some circumstances the solution may be complexity and in some circumstances the solution may be simplicity. I think, again, it comes back to value judgments because you say, well, what are the incentives acting on the agents within this system? The incentive of the regulator is to sort of dampen the oscillations and to, and to keep the system stable. But the incentive on individual players, what is that incentive? Well, for a company, hopefully their incentive is to be there in the long term. And so they do want to manage risk, but they can, in the short term, make money by you know picking up pennies in front of the bulldozer. They can sort of take advantage in the short term by underpricing risk. And underpricing risk is almost always a good strategy until it suddenly isn't and you get wiped out. And this is another of Taleb's fundamental points. Or, um, if, you don't, or if you don't pay the fine. Or if you don't pay the fine. And so then it's back to skin in the game. So, so the question I think about whether then the individuals who are running insurance companies or banks, what is their individual incentive and the penalization structure when things go wrong? You know, you, you sort of assume that you can change the behavior by putting sort of company level incentives in place. And, and yes, you know, that kind of works, but actually the individuals involved, you can go bust multiple times times and come back and do the same thing again. If you, I mean, one example I mentioned in my book is the long-term capital management and the way that they went bust uh, as a hedge fund by 
effectively by underestimating their risk. But you see that the people that were involved with that, well, they're not, you know, they're not out of the game. They went, long-term capital management went bust, but the individuals involved didn't. And they came back and they did the same thing again. And I think, you know, the manager of that hedge fund came back and set up another one and then that went bust as well. So what are the incentive systems and what is the accountability, the longer term accountability? And then you're back to value judgments because what is it what is it that individuals are trying to do here? Is this a cooperative game or is it a zero sum game? Are we trying to create a financial system which is viable for everybody in the long term future or are we trying to extract as much profit as we can possibly get in the short term and then get out and enjoy it? You know, and that's a value judgment and it's a way of being and a way of acting and a way of thinking and interacting with others. So actually, I think that you can't get around these uh, large scale instabilities unless the players in the game are sort of treating it as a cooperative game. Two things come, came to my mind. Uh, now, one, they're not the same things, but one thing is Nassim Taleb, for instance, says, if I, if I interpret him correctly, that volatility or oscillation per se is not a problem yeah. because he brings the example of if you take the restaurants of a city mm -hmm. then if you open a restaurant your volatility so to speak or your individual risk is very high because he, as you know a lot of restaurants go yeah. bankrupt because i don't know you did not operate it well or people didn't want pasta anymore they now want kebab i don't know whatever it might be so your individual risk is very high, but and this might is your problem. Maybe as a society, we should take care that you're not ruined after that. But that's mm. now a social problem. But overall, but it, somebody else will come in and set up a new exactly. restaurant and there will be the provision for the customers. Yeah, exactly. So, But if you take the city as a, as a system, this is not in no way an existential risk. But when you have systems like our banks, where you, where they are allegedly too big to fail, and now we remember the last months, we had a number of banks that were too big to fail, and they were suddenly bought by another bank. Now we have even a bigger bank that's even bigger to fail. And now, of course, volatility is a problem, because vol volatility now means you ruin a bank that is really system critical, and maybe with a domino effect, five others on top of that. So I think volatility per se clearly is not the issue, right? It's a question of the systemic interconnection. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and the second point, which which might be even more interesting, is because you also mentioned in your book, you mentioned Andy Haldane, I think this is the, I don't yep. know how to pronounce it. And Neil Ferguson, I read recently, says something very similar. And Neil Ferguson in an interview said a little bit cheeky, like, uh, regulation is the disease of which it pretends to be the cure. Yeah, And then he says, like, surely once we have written a regulation for every possible misdeed, then good behavior will ensue. So I think the we see it very often. Also, I had a conversation with a lawyer a year ago on, a, in, in, on my channel. And I think the problem is there seems to be the idea that we have a complex system and we have to regulate it down to every nail and every screw because then it will be safe. Mm. But clearly it's not because we try to, at least in my opinion, you try to regulate a complex system with a complex mechanism and what comes out is an even more complex system. Yep. <laughs> which typically benefits the big companies yeah. who have the means, the law firms, the accounting firms, who help them drill every hole. This is also what Nassim Taleb said. They were always happy about every regulation because they had something new to exploit yeah, yeah. and not to the good of, of, of society, right? Yeah, I mean, I'd agree with that. I think that... You know, is I guess that's back to what I was saying about the the incentives for the players within the system, that if everybody is treating it as a cooperative game, then you can kind of the stability will emerge. And if everybody is treating it as something where they're out for themselves, then the instabilities will emerge naturally. Um, so that actually further regulation doesn't necessarily help you. Now, I, I'm not sure I completely agree. I mean, I think this, this is kind of, this is also encapsulating a political standpoint about the role of government and the, and, and a, and a kind of from first principles standpoint that regulation is not necessarily a good thing and I don't I don't think I would completely agree with that. I think that we do need regulation and that the the right kind of regulation can be beneficial to a system. You know, you have to set the rules within which everybody operates and there are always going to be some kind of rules. If there were no rules at all, whether they were set by a regulator or or sort of socially enforced, there were no rules at all, then I don't see how anything could could work. No, I would, sorry, I also don't think that then I probably didn't represent Neil Ferguson correctly, just put out like a catchy phrase here. But yeah. he didn't, in his conversation, he didn't say we should have no regulation. 
Yeah, he sure. said okay. we, we I mean, need a I different type of regulation. I don't think that and, regulation yeah. per se is bad, but I think yeah, that actually yeah. regulation that proceeds from an alignment of values and incentives is more effective than, as yes. you say, one that attempts to kind of nail every hole individually yeah. because there will always be in a complex system, there will always be more holes that you have to nail. And when you nail one hole, then you spring a leak somewhere else. Yeah. yeah. I think this would be pretty much what he said. Yeah. That, you, But I think it's much harder and probably also much harder to sell, much harder to make such type of regulation and also much harder to sell it because people always believe, oh, more transparency, more regulation, all of that is good, but not really. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. It's because you're sort of, you're trying to create a system rather than, rather than regulate Exactly. You know, your your sort of how do you create a self-regulating system where you have a bunch of people on the ship who will go and nail the holes when they see them because it's in their own interest not to have a ship that sinks, rather than one where everybody sort of has their own lifeboat and if the ship sinks then they're going to make off with all the cargo. And maybe like as a as a final question, what is your opinion about what we experienced in the last years with COVID, climate, and uh, I don't know what. Do you think we learned as a society um, from how we used models and and how we should use them in the future? Because because at the moment there's a lot of talk about oh there's such a such a skepticism about expertise and so on. And I, and I say yeah actually, but that's not necessarily a bad thing if people mm. tend to be more critical about who is an expert and who is not. But maybe I'm wrong. So do you see it rather positive or rather? problematic or what should we do to so that we come as a society to a, to a better handling and better use of models well i think a bit of both really you know i think i think it's been a really interesting kind of real time case study of how to use models in decision making and maybe also how not to use them um and you know we're not going to get it right every time so certainly there are lots of lessons to learn i think that we are learning those mm. lessons And as we learn some lessons, maybe the pendulum swings too far in another direction. And if we go too far towards, you know, decision making based on values and intuition and we throw away the models completely, that would be going too far. And we'll end up, you know, having difficulty the next time we have some kind of big critical thing to think about. And then perhaps the pendulum swings back the other way. So... Uh, I think I think it's kind of an ongoing process of of navigating the ability of science and the function of science in society. Clearly, there is a movement, you know, not just in the last three years, but in the last fifty years, towards science being a more fundamental part of decision making and having a much bigger place at the table in terms of deciding how policy making and decision making ought to take place. And that that is but, uh, but sorry, to some to extent a good but, thing. And but but you don't think that we we should let experts decide? I mean, like like in the platonic sense, like well, we do. Like we will Plato always said, let experts yeah. decide. The question is how we how we determine who is the expert. Like in pre yeah, but in, in a practice, political sense, in, in a practice, practice sense? nobody. Well, what do you mean then? No, I mean like uh, Pla Platon had in his uh, one of his dialogues the idea that every king should be philosopher, or, or, or only philosophers should be king. Like to the modern, to the modern example, that uh, to the modern times, it would probably mean scientist. Yeah. Every politician should be a scientist, and and then he or she takes the right decisions. This is not what you mean, I suppose. No, no? that's not what I mean. I think I think that the policy making and decision making are a different skill from science, and so obviously it's helpful if policy makers, decision makers makers are equipped to understand the language of science and to be able to ask intelligent questions about the science and to be able to critique and to say, actually, you know, does this embody my values or does it not? And and to be in dialogue. And I think we have got better at at dialogue between policymakers and scientists. And and part of that comes out as this, you know, all of this question about experts and who is an expert and do we trust the experts or not. But I mean ultimately the definition of an expert is somebody whose judgments you are willing to accept as your own. And so if somebody if somebody claims to be an expert but you don't trust them, then de facto they are not an expert. So we have this sort of social question of how we decide who is competent to be trusted with these kind of information gathering processes. And I think that that should be scientists. I think that scientists and science per se have a lot to offer, but I think that we do need to be really careful about how we integrate that with these questions about values and politics so that we're not just 
steamrollering into one particular way of viewing the world and that we are open to criticism and open to alternative value judgments and can reflect that and can be kind of, you know, responsive to questions rather than just stuck in this kind of brittle mode of saying, follow the science, you know, that science is neutral, science is objective, you just have to do it. Because I think that is what will undermine the status of science and the ability of science to contribute to these kind of questions is if if we just retreat into this shell of saying science is objective, you must listen. You know, we have to we have to be more open and we have to be more nuanced about how we integrate different perspectives into science. Erica, thank you so much for the conversation. Well, thank you. It's been fun. <laughs>